Do you want to learn how to trade stocks and cryptocurrency? Join our community of traders. Go to richpicksdaily.com and find the next 10 bagger. Hi, how's everybody doing today? I am your host, Rich. Here we have Rich TV Live with our very special guest, the CEO of Radix, Piers Ridyard. How are you doing today, Piers? Great to be here. Thank you very much for having me, Rich. Always a pleasure. Excited to have you on the show. Why don't we get started and you can give us a brief history on yourself and your team at Radix. Absolutely. So Radix has been around for a while. It got started early in the crypto space. Dan Hughes, the founder of Radix, actually got his start in 2012 with Bitcoin. Uh, and he, he was like, oh my God, this is amazing technology. And then and then 2013, he'd just taken it apart a bit and was like, no, this is not going to work. And so he was like, oh, you know, six months, I could probably knock something together that, that, that works better. Uh, and then seven years later he was like yeah i think i've got it now um and the the it was it's, he's such an interesting guy like his his background is he, he helped build uh, the mobile internet platform for t-mobile um in europe and then he also built like some payment technologies that you find in near field communication um payments when you do tap to pay on the card wow. uh, and so like crypto and networks and consensus that was all sort of like his bread and butter before that and then payments was something that he knew a lot about so bitcoin made instant sense to him and then he was like well it's not going to work for seven billion people like it's not even close to being able to work for seven billion people and like i see this is the future i see the promise but it has to it has to do better um and i met him i don't know 2015 uh at like an ethereum meetup and he was just this in super intriguing combination of like a really northern dude with a really like strong stoke accent kind of like the equivalent of meeting someone like with a really strong oklahoma accent or really strong tennessee accent in the u.s um but like super intelligent one of the best programmers i've ever met and like this polymath who just like eats economics textbooks and consensus theory textbooks and kind of like smashes them together in his brain to make what what uh radix has become and on my background, I I uh, got st I was I'm I created a Y Combinator company in 2017 that was building like deal room software for big insurance companies, uh, and I was actually already building on Radix's tech stack by then. We, we I, I met Dan in 2015, and then I just got more and more excited by Dan's technology, and I was like, sod this enterprise stuff. This this is the future and i and and i can be part of it and dan was like i want you to come on as ceo and i was like absolutely sold so he he um he ended up acquiring my company and i became part of radix um but since then we've built the team out there's like now 33 of us our backgrounds include people from consensus people from visa people from t-mobile from nvidia from texas instruments from nem from ibm from ubs from microsoft so like a pretty like a pretty awesome team of like people um and it's sort of it, like all things that sort of go exponential you start off with this this nugget of an idea and then as you start to get more clarity on what it is that you need to build and why you start to being able to like pull in these great people and build out a team that can actually deliver you know what our vision is peers we'd like to get off uh, and understand an elevator pitch for the people that haven't heard of radix tell us what it is and what you're trying to build absolutely so radix is a layer one protocol um so layer one is anything like ethereum is a layer one protocol bitcoin's is a layer one protocol ripple is a layer one protocol um but it's a layer one protocol built specifically to serve decentralized finance uh which is why like why we like to say it's a uh, layer one DeFi done right uh, and the reason that we say that is there are three things that radix delivers um to basically solve all of the issues that we're currently seeing in DeFi. the first is 10x developer productivity um, the second is 100x DeFi security, and the third is 1000x more scalability than any other layer one protocol out there. Uh, and the reason that we need to deliver these three things is because DeFi, even though it's got product market fit and it's incredibly successful right now, we've gone from a billion dollars under management in the DeFi industry 18 months ago to 120 billion dollars under management to date that's in that's an insane amount of growth but it's got all of these problems and so radix radix is basically the only platform that we see out there that can solve 
DeFi scalability problems, DeFi buildability problems, DeFi security problems to bring decentralized finance mainstream, which is like why we say Radix is the only decentralized network where developers will be able to build quickly without the constant threat of exploits and hacks, where every employment will get, where every improvement gets rewarded and where scale will never be a bottleneck. Wow, that's impressive. Now, I love DeFi. Here at RichDB Live, we love decentralized finance. We've actually been interviewing a couple public companies that are in the DeFi space. And I love the idea that DeFi is going to compete against the banking system because they're providing bigger returns on investment than the average bank. I think it's brilliant. I think it's the future of finance. I love the fact that you guys are in the DeFi space. Now in saying that, you mentioned it a little bit, there are many different projects, which I talked about, that offer solutions to the problem of DeFi. So what makes Radix better? That's a great question. So the thing is, is that while the crypto space sometimes feels like it moves really quickly, it actually doesn't. Because what everyone is doing, like, have you heard the expression, less haste, more speed? Yes. Right? Where if you stop and just think about something for five minutes and then be smarter about it, you can end up having, you know, a 10x, 100x improvement than, than just like shoveling dirt. You go and get a tractor, that kind of thing, right? Um, and that's kind of what the crypto space constantly does because there's this like immense pressure to just build, deliver, build, deliver, build, deliver, build, deliver, build, deliver, build, deliver, and as quickly as possible, which means that a lot of the stuff on top churns very quickly, but everything else stays like really constant, like public private key security is still a problem and still sucks like for the most part user Absolutely. experience of DeFi, even though metamask has been around for a very long time still sucks for the most part and like scalability is still an issue it's been an issue for like f since crypto kitties i mean it was an issue for bitcoin like that's why bitcoin cash exists is because scalability is an issue like we've been thinking about this for more than a like almost a decade now right and it's still an issue so what makes Radix difference is this this 10x developer um, productivity is we looked at Solidity and we thought about it for a bit. So Solidity is the language that you use to program DeFi today. And it was developed by Ethereum. And basically every other major project out there, every other layer one has just taken Solidity and gone, yeah, 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 cool, we'll run with that. We'll run with that. We'll use that. But if you go to the traditional space, now Solidity is based on JavaScript. Right, which is a programming language, very popular programming language for web. And if you went to any like neo bank, like so, like the Monzos, the N twenty sixes, the Revoluts. I don't know what you guys have in Canada, but I'm sure you guys got some startup banks out in Canada as well. Yes. And you said to the CTO of those banks, and you said, "Hey, I want you to build your core technology in JavaScript." They would literally beat you to death with a baseball bat. It is the worst language you could possibly imagine to build critical financial systems, like literally the worst. And that is what we're doing in DeFi. And so with Radix, we just went, that is insane. Let's let's think about this a bit more and go, if we want DeFi to be the future of finance, if we want the world to have a safe place in which their money lives and grows, then shouldn't we start with a language that means that you aren't going to constantly get hacks and bugs and exploits and money's going to disappear, right? Which is what we have, right? We have $600 million that just went puff two days ago with the Polygon hack. Before that, there was $285 million of DeFi hacks. And so we created a language called Scripto, which will be released, released later this year, comes out at the end of the year. And instead, of, and we started by just going and interviewing all of the leading DeFi projects and all of the leading DeFi developers and going, hey, tell us all of the ways in which script, uh, which Solidity sucks. And let's see how we can think about building these, pro the, 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 these um, this programming language better. Now, the thing that was insane when we went and spoke to these div Solidity developers is that the average Solidity developer spends 90, 90% of his time securing his code wow. and 10 percent of it building functionality wow now imagine what could have happened in the DeFi space if those numbers were flipped right Huge imagine vision. how much more innovation how much more products how much more interesting stuff how much more closer we would be to eating the world of traditional finance with just that one change
So we went, that's a 10x. We're going to do that. We're going to make a language specifically for decentralized finance that doesn't make people who understand how to build finance go, there is no way I'm coming into this industry and building on that language. Absolutely no way. Like, are you mad? Right. <laughs> and then the ne and then the next level beyond that, we were like, the execution machine. And this is a bit technical, but like everything that runs on top of a ledger runs in an execution machine. It's like the, the, the virtual machines run all of this code, right? And that's how the computers come to agreement as to what whether or not your Uniswap transaction has gone through. And Ethereum, again, built the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. And again, everyone is adopting that. Polkadot's adopted it. Avalanche has adopted it. Hashgraph has adopted it, right? But it sucks. It's so bad for purpose because what it is, is it's not designed for critical systems. Like if you go to NASDAQ, the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, or you go to the London Stock Exchange and you go, let me see your matching engine. They wouldn't go, here's a Turing complete environment for execution. They would go, here's a finite state machine. And like, again, really technical, but massive difference in execution security. And so we completely pulled out the Ethereum virtual machine and went, let's put a much more secure execution environment in that gives 100x more security. 100x more security in just, just swapping out how functions are executed on top of Ledger. So you don't get bugs, you don't get recursions, and you don't end up in these situations because most of these hacks are caused by working out how to push the code into an error state and then taking advantage of that error state. And by going to the Radix engine, you just get rid of like 99% of those things, right? So wow. there's your 100x, right? Wow. Now you mentioned before that Ethereum can't scale. Can you break that mm. down a bit? Yeah. So if anyone's used Ethereum, they know how expensive it is, right? The gas you try... fees. Yeah, the gas fees. Yes. Terrible. So you you go you go to like Uniswap. You're like, hey man, that looks like a great pool. I want to put some. I want to go to put some tokens in there and get that yield. Oh, it's a two hundred dollar gas fee. And Terrible. if you're putting in a thousand bucks, what you got? You got eight hundred bucks afterwards. You've got to make twenty percent just to make back your gas fees, and then you've got to pay two hundred dollars to get it out again. And the reason it costs so much is because Ethereum is basically running an auction system, and you are competing against other people who want to be in those blocks and there's a limited amount of space to get your transactions in so you are bidding essentially a bidding war in every single block which is which when there isn't enough capacity when there isn't enough throughput on the network ethereum can do 15 transactions per second 15 transactions per second and when there isn't enough capacity then everyone has a bidding war and then it becomes incredibly expensive so it's not the miners that are making it expensive. It's everyone's like desire to use these systems making it expensive. And so there are several approaches to this. One approach is to build layer two. But Polygon is a layer two and it just had a $600 million hack. Like layer twos are not as secure. They're as secure as the, as the code that implements them, not as secure as the underlying layer ledger. And they're not really that much more scalable. Like they're a bit more scalable. So 15 transactions per second for on Ethereum Polygon, I think did like 2000 transactions per second. But if we're going to eat finance, the financial world right now does about 2 million transactions per second, right? Wow. So you're taking all the stock markets, you're taking, uh, you know, all of the money exchanges, you're taking all of the money payments that are happening. It's about 2 million transactions per second, give or take, right? And then DeFi, what DeFi does is it's this incredible thing that it like allows decentralized finance applications to be composed together, right? So I can take my, I can go from Uniswap to SushiSwap, from SushiSwap to Aave, from Aave to Compound, and I can do it all inside a single block. And so actually... It's like when people are like, oh, isn't De like DeFi just needs to do 2 million transactions per second. You're like, no, that's the wrong comparison because that's like going, well, the Internet only needs to deal with the bandwidth of the phone network that is that that came before it. Like when you're sitting at the start of the Internet, and you're going, how much bandwidth does the Internet need? And you go, well, we make this many phone calls. So maybe that's how much 
bandwidth it's just like no it's a it's a paradigm shift one transaction on traditional finance is now 10 100 different operations on top of DeFi, right so if we take if we eat traditional finance that's like 20 million transactions per second 100 million transactions per second that wow. needs to do and then add to that the fact that traditional finance only services like 15 percent of the world's population and with DeFi, we make it more accessible to everyone you start to see what kind of throughput we need. So if you go, oh, well, you know, Solana is enough with 65,000 transactions per second or Hashgraph or Algorand or Avalanche or Near, and just, it's not even in the right ballpark, not even, not even close to playing the right game that is necessary to scale DeFi to mainstream. So Ethereum is stuck and doesn't scale. And that's what the problem is. And Radix, takes a completely radical approach to scaling uh, decentralized finance, which is why we're able to get to eventually, you know, 20 million transactions per second, 100 million transactions per second that will happen in time. Wow, that's impressive. Can you go into how the blueprint component catalog will work? Sure. So the blueprint component catalog. Again, this is like if you're a developer, you, you, you'll be like, yeah, this is this is awesome. And then if you're not a developer, you're like, what? Um, <laughs> so in the developer in the in the developer world, there is this there, there's this really important tool called GitHub. Yes, right? very familiar with GitHub. Cool. So like GitHub is where is, is where so much of the coordination collaboration that happens in, in software development like software isn't really most software development isn't really starting from scratch open new files start coding and then and then the project appears most software development is hanging out on stack overflow and on github and then finding the 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 libraries that you need to be able to stitch together the functionality you be like okay i need this particular function to do this particular thing let's say it's like parsing a database oh okay i'll go get that library that someone's already built on github and i'll integrate it into my application so i don't have to write it myself there's no point in like why do you why would you do the insane thing of continually rewrite it's like if you wanted to build um a, a, a printer and decided that you were also going to build all the computer chips inside it you don't do that so in code very 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 common for developers to go and use a hell of a lot of code libraries by other people and then stitch it together to create their own applications on radix the blueprint catalog is just extending this idea of what already happens with developers we were like on radix what you do is you instantiate the library for creating something and then you call it so what I mean by that is on Ethereum, if you want to create a token on Ethereum, you don't go to the Ethereum network and say, give me a token. What you do is you take the ERC20 contract, which is a full computer program that defines what a token is. And then you get the Ethereum ledger to run that full computer program. So every single Ethereum token has its own separate computer program running separately that defines their own token, which we're like, that's insane. Why would you do that? Instead, what you do on Radix is you define what a token means to the ledger. And then if I want to create the peers token, I just call that definition. I go, hey, create, give me a peers token, five of them, single issuance, um, at, you know, divisible by 10, like 10 decimal places. And so it just calling the definition just gives you the token. And so this on ledger GitHub library, um, it, it allows developers to basically push standards to the ledger and then people to call them. So if someone could create the Uniswap, the, the constant function market maker standard, right? And I could instantiate peer swap and you could instantiate rich swap, right? And you do that single API call, but then you can also make that as components. So you'd be like, right, I need this component from that guy. I need this component from that guy, that component from that guy. I stitch them together and I've created, you know, peer swap farming or something like that, that, that together has made this new application as a result of being able to stitch together these little bits of code. And then we were like, wow, that's great. But what if you could also make royalties come from that? So that every time someone used one of your components, if you're a developer and you're like, man, I'm great at coding, but I do not want to deal with customers. You can sit down, you can build a great component, you can put it on the ledger. And if someone integrates it in their DeFi application and makes a load of money, you get a royalty from that. Right. And we bake that 
right into the center of Radix so that everyone in the community can get rewarded for, for participating and contributing to the ledger. That's brilliant. And that's what people need. They need incentive to want to put in their hard work and time and effort. So I think that's a brilliant idea. Now you touched a little bit on some recent DeFi hacks. Yeah. How does Radix prevent that kind of hacks from happening? Yeah, so like um, each hack is unique. Is a unique baby um, that uh, that that ends up being spawn of Satan to someone. Um, so each hack is normally a, there's there's several like very common mistakes you can make. A recursion error is is a really common one, um, which essentially allows you to make a call that iterates a call where you end up being able to siphon off funds. It's it like it goes back to the DAO hack in 2015. That was caused by a recursion error, and then um, uh, there are hacks like being uh, like being silly with admin keys, uh, making your product product production environment, your dev environment the same, and then releasing your dev code. Like um, like every mistake you can think of has been made, but they all end up in some variation of a hacker being able to withdraw funds that he shouldn't be able to in a system, and the combination of scripto a programming language designed specifically for decentralized finance development and then this thing that scripto does which is doesn't even compile if a lot of the common like mistakes you can make in code are there it won't even it won't even get into a position locally that you could push it onto the ledger so it doesn't stop you it, it, it you can think of it like guardrails for developers it's not it's not going to actually prevent you from building whatever you want but if you've made a actual internal error it's not going to stop you doing any functionality you want but any a specific internal error where it's like this just that shouldn't ever compile because there's an error between here and here then you can't you can't compile it you can't push it onto the ledger which is really really useful for developers so that's one way in which a lot of these hacks are stopped because things like recursion errors are, 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 are caught even before it can be pushed onto the ledger and then the second way it comes down to the radix engine which is um it on 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 radix everything compiles into a finite state machine a set of finite state machines and what a finite state machine is is a little bit like um it's a little bit like Pokemon, all right? Yeah. So Pokemon, you have you start off with Squirtle, right? And when Squirtle's awake, he can either evolve or he can go in, into a fight. But if he's in a fight, he can't evolve. And if it is a fight, he can either faint or he can he can not faint. He can win, right? And then when he comes out, the, he, if he comes out the fight fainted then he can't evolve, right? And then once he comes out of being in his faint, he comes back awake, he can then evolve, but only on the condition that certain things are met. And then he's now the next one. I can't remember what the mid middle one is, and then that goes to, on to War Turtle. Now, in a finite state machine, you declare the states of the system. You say it can only be in these five states, and it can only transition between these states on these conditions. And this is different from how Ethereum code is declared, which is just if-then statements. And so if you go, if this happens, then do that. It's much easier to get into error states. And that is essentially how the Radix engine stops um, execution security, increases execution security and, and avoids a lot of these problems as well. As a developer, I know you touched on this, why would I come and build on Radix versus Ethereum? Because it seems like most of the DeFi ecosystem is on the Ethereum. Yeah, it's a great question. So if you're someone who already understands the Ethereum network and already understands Solidity, and you've built up that oeuvre of knowledge, that, that base of knowledge over four years, over five years of making mistakes, getting hacked, like, and learning all of the foibles of solidity, yeah, we're not for you. Like you've built a skill set that's incredibly valuable for you in, in 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 Ethereum, right? But if you're a developer who is super excited about decentralized finance, knows a lot about it, but is looking at solidity and going, that's absolutely terrifying. There is no way I want to build in that because I might get hacked, right? Because I might lose pe other people's money. Which a lot of people that that's that's an internal worry for getting into DeFi. Your developer 
if you don't you don't think about this as an investor right but like the developer who loses your money like if they're a good person think what they're going through at the point that that happens like it must be the Fair. worst day of their life right absolutely and then and then there's this other set of developers who are fantastic enterprise developers and you know get paid l huge amounts of money and are looking at this explosion of opportunity in DeFi and going, man, I love that. That looks great. I'm a finance, I'm a fine 10 year, 20 year experience finance developer. And there's all of this incredible, exciting stuff happening in finance. And then they go and look at Solidity in the Solidity docs and they go, no way. There is no way I'm going to build using this code, the, 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 this, the, this language. So I see, I see our opportunity as being both of those places, like giving the people who are terrified by Solidity and that they might get hacked the opportunity to build their dream application and giving this massive, you know, like we think that the, 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 the DeFi Solidity developer community is tiny in comparison to the enterprise, to the finance, to the, to the just wider developer community. And for this to go mainstream, we have to make the tools accessible to the mainstream devel developers. Otherwise, you don't you, you won't get mainstream applications. So we're not looking at this. We're not looking at the Ethereum community and going, we have to get all of these developers. We're looking at the world and going, how do we bring the world to DeFi? Fantastic. Now, Piers, I have seen you mention GoodFi. Can mm -hmm. you tell why Radix founded it? It's odd to see competitors working together in such a way. Yeah, it's great. It's a great question. So in the early days of the internet, it was really difficult to get people online. Like yes. people forget this, but like, man, it was complicated because the first thing you had to do was convince someone to get a computer because yeah. not everyone had computers. Yeah. Like, all right, that's a $2,000 investment because computers are expensive and like, and, yes. and, and like explaining to someone why they would want a computer who has no computers in their life is a really difficult thing. It's like, because, because you, it's, it's so much opportunity, but so difficult to explain to them why it's a good thing, just like practically speaking to have. Right. And then the next thing you need to do is convince them to connect to the internet and connecting to the internet involves giving up your phone line or paying double or triple what you're already paying for your phone line getting an engineer out to drill into your house and like install extra things like it was like involved to get the internet because you had to and you had to pay there was a cost people i don't know in canada maybe you pay a connection cost but like in a lot of countries you don't pay a connection cost anymore it's just included in your package but like used to be like two three hundred dollars two three hundred wow. bucks to pay someone to drill a hole in my wall and connect me to the internet right yeah and then, and then once they had these two things, they now had to you learn to use this new thing called a web browser. And it just required so much education and so much patience and so much like people just being like, no, like there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's painful now, but at the end of it, I promise you, this is something incredible and new that you will love. And it will become an integral part of your life. And there was these small numbers of people who were incredibly passionate about the promise of the Internet. And they brought it to the masses through their passion and through their patience. Right. DeFi is the same. Right. Like trying to get like convincing someone to buy crypto to get into DeFi, you need crypto. Getting crypto is still a, a, a ball ache. Right. Getting an exchange account, go like working out how to link your bank, getting a payment across, getting the crypto, then getting the crypto into a Web3 wallet. What the hell is a Web3 wallet? Like MetaMask and the insanity of the user experience that is MetaMask. Um, and then then they have to pick a DeFi application. And where do you start? What do you do? You go, go to DeFi Llama and choose which one you want. Like every single way in which every single DeFi project explains themselves is explaining themselves to the DeFi audience not to the everyday person and every single one is impenetrable like the, the like you know a a decentralized permissionless liquidity pool that allows you to add collateral to be able to collateralize your position and lend it and borrow or lend against it like what the hell does that mean <laughs> for the everyday person like you show that to your mother or to your sister or to you know anyone who's not in DeFi, they'll be like i understood one to two words in that sentence 
And so we created Good Fight because we believe that it is necessary to evangelize and educate, to bring DeFi to the masses, to 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 get us to the point where there are 100 million users. So the, 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 the role of DeFi, it's a not-for-profit founded to get 100 million users to put one dollar into DeFi by 2025 and 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 we believe that that is a simple mission that anyone can understand and the reason it's a dollar and not like a percentage of your income is because you've got to break the problem down and the first problem is just getting people past the pain of getting to the point that they can get money into DeFi in the first place once you're there the world is your oyster now you've got you know single sign on finance but you've got to get people there so you know we've got Sushi Swap and Avalanche and Chainlink and a bunch of more people that we're going to be uh, announcing. M Stable, we got like uh, 30 members already, and then like a bunch more that we haven't announced yet that that wow. are coming in. And you're right, there's some competitors there, right? Radix and Avalanche are our competitors, but like this isn't about. It's not about arguing about who wins the market that exists already. It's about increasing the total addressable market in the first place Absolutely. and like just give people the give people the safe starting point into DeFi, and that's what good is that's what the goodfi.com website is for is just to be like here's a place that isn't too noisy that has a few assets and a few platforms and a filtered view so that you're not going oh what's this three thousand percent per annum pool it's no look here's usdc and ethereum pool on uniswap and it's a reasonable pool like get involved like you and like here's an explanation of what usdc and ethereum is and explained in a way that doesn't use jargon like that's what is necessary to start bringing in the non-crypto native people and that's why we founded DeFi. Uh, good fine i love what you're doing because it's very similar to what i'm doing here at rich tv live people feel the same way about stocks imagine how <laughs> they feel about crypto so if people are scared of stocks and it's so easy to go and set up an account to buy and sell stocks, imagine how overwhelmed they are with crypto. Now we add DeFi to the mix. So I totally get what you're saying. Simplifying it is going to make it easier for the masses to get in. I love what you guys are doing. I love your vision. What are the next steps for Radix as the CEO, Pierce? As the CEO? <laughs> So it's a funny question because the CEO's job is like one of like almost like traffic management and evangelism and like fire putting out. So the next yes. steps for me is, uh, is 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 hopefully building an amazing team that can sort of build this, deliver this vision. But the next steps for Radix, um, we have a really ambitious roadmap um, like to bring out like 10x developer um, productivity 100x DeFi security 1000x scalability like those are not small goals and we're not releasing them all at once we are we have just done our main net release uh, called Olympia and this is like think about just all of the things that we're doing we're changing the scripting letter the programming language we're changing the execution environment we're changing the consensus we're changing basically everything about what it means to be a decentralized ledger technology and so we're releasing these in stages. So Olympia has just gone live. That doesn't have decentralized finance on it. It's literally just a network to prove out our security, to prove our execution environment, to prove out our um, transaction model. Uh, the next thing that comes along at the end of this year, Alexandria are, is going to be our programming language scripto. That's going to be released in a sandbox environment so that developers can start playing around with it and we can start getting feedback on it. Like one of the things that, Solid that, that Ethereum did wrong is they didn't spend time getting feedback on Solidity. Well, they did, they jammed it straight into the into Ethereum because they were desperate to get it out quickly. And it's now got all of these problems. And so we were like, well, let's just give it a bit of time to, for people to play around it, give us feedback, make sure that we're doing it right, like do the proper product development thing. And then, then that gets integrated in Babylon next year. So that's when DeFi goes live on Radix. It's also when our royalties programs go live on Radix. And then uh, the year after that is when Xi'an goes live. And Xi'an is when our fully sharded, fully linearly scalable network goes live. And the reason we're doing it in this order is because it's in the order that matters. You focus on developer usability first, then you focus on ecosystem and royalties and then you and DeFi, and then you focus on scalability because 
even though I'd like to say, hey, Radix is going to be doing 10 million transactions a second from day one. It's not. It's not because that's not what that's not what um, true adoption looks like. Right. Adoption is an exponent which looks little at the start and then suddenly goes really big. And so we don't need to deliver massive scalability. I mean, we're already like three and a half times more scalable than, than Ethereum. We're just going to keep going up from there. But like we don't need to deliver massive scalability at the start. And massive scalability is the really complicated bit. So we have a roadmap. We have uh, we have proofs around academic proofs around how we achieve all of these things but we're building in the order that makes sense for building the best possible solution for the for the market and so that's what the next two three years look like for us that's exciting it's going to be an exciting couple of years now you mentioned the olympia mainnet has just gone live mm. i saw from your social media that 440 x 440 million xrd has been staked to the network which is very impressive can you talk a little bit about that 440 million xrd yeah it's um I, it's astounding i'm like i'm so blown away and so thankful to the radix community and everyone who's done that so the xrd or the radix token uh, um, ticker symbol xrd that is the native uh token of the radix network um you if you have some on your de on your wallet, or you can you can pick any node to stake in the network, and you can stake uh, against, stake against that node single click, super easy. Uh, and 440 million rads have already been staked, which equates to about 65 million dollars wow. worth of network security that has come across basically in the last 72 hours. Wow. Uh, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah. So that's congratulations. Yeah. So. As the CEO, this has got to be pretty exciting. Obviously, we've talked almost for an hour about this, and I'm super excited about DeFi. Thank you for joining us today. Piers Ridyard, the CEO of Radix. Anything else you want to say to the audience and the viewers that are watching today before we say goodbye, Piers? Uh, just massive thank you to you for hosting me. Uh, it's been great being on here. And if you want to learn more about Radix, go to radixdlt.com, R-A-D-I-X-D-L-T.com. We've also on Twitter, um, at radixdlt, and we're also on Telegram, where lots of people hang out. Um, if you want to find any of those links, go to our website and come join the community because it is one of the best ones in crypto in my opinion my humble opinion <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today this has been an incredible interview where i've personally learned so much about radix and about DeFi, and i'm a very big fan of decentralized finance and for those of you guys that are watching at home if you like the video please smash the like button comment down below share the video everywhere and subscribe remember rich tv live we are strictly for information education purposes so please do your due diligence do your research before you invest in anything that we talk about or discuss here on Rich TV Live. In saying it, I love the project. I love decentralized finance. Big fan of Radix. I'm going to be telling our entire community about this project and getting as many people learning and getting involved as humanly possible. Thank you for your time today. Piers Ridyard, the CEO of Radix. Thank you for explaining the project and keep up the great work. Thank you very much, man. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. And thank you guys for watching. If you're not winning, you're not watching. We bring you the winners and we bring them to you first. This is Rich from Rich to be live. Have a nice day, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.